When I was living at home, my dad used to tell me of a great inheritance I would receive from him. And that inheritance was his old beat-up Honda Accord. <laughs> Actually, the Honda Accord would break down and then he'd get another beat-up one and he'd still say, you're going to get my inheritance. So you can imagine my excitement. We're actually going to read about this in a way. So turn to Romans 8. We're still in that chapter. We're going to continue learning about living in the Spirit today. Um, we're transformed in the Spirit. And that transformation is, is so absolute that not only are we made friends of God because we were once enemies, but we are made uh, as children. And it's not like we say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm his kid. A relationship is so close to where we call God Papa. It's pretty weird, right? But as his children, we get to share in the inheritance with Christ. And I guarantee you that inheritance is not a Honda Accord. So we're reading in 12 to se uh, verses 12 to 17, so why don't we stand up? It's Romans 8, 12 to 17. And again, it's in the Spirit. We're transformed and we have victory through Him. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of, your, of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit, who receive, uh, the Spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You may be seated. Well, it's our joy to come before the Lord and hear his voice from his word and follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the transformation work that He's doing in our life, even now as we listen to His Word. Let's first come to Him and acknowledge His presence, acknowledge His work in our life, and that uh, we may be responding to Him properly with praise, with obedience. Lord, we recognize Your presence among us. We recognize Your function as the spirit of truth that will guide us into the word of revelation concerning our Christ. And we praise you for what you are doing because without you, Lord, we cannot understand the word, we cannot apply the word, and we will be uh, uh, famished uh, even with the word in our hands. So we pray that you speak to us, guide us into your truth, open our minds to understand, open our heart to respond, and just help us, Lord, to listen in worship, to listen in obedience, to listen in joy. We thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we heard the text read to us in the uh, bigger context of adoption. Uh, and we will be going into the, uh, the uh, area of adoption soon. But as uh, I started out uh, looking into this, there's a connection uh, to the to the privilege of being God's uh, children, and that is uh, the victory over sin in uh, verses uh, 12 to 13. So we kind of separate that out from the connection uh, and just do the preparation work uh, that help us to understand the greatness of adoption as we will uh, come to the f f uh, fullness of this uh, passage. Uh, but, uh, but today we're going to have a particular, particular focus on the victory over sin. Now, Romans 8, as we, as we mentioned, is, is a chapter about life in the Spirit. Uh, it is uh, the chapter that describing how we who have the Holy Spirit can live our spiritual life. And it starts out with a, an amazing and wonderful statement in, chapter, uh, in verse 1 that we uh, came often, but uh, it's good to come back. And, and to read it that with uh, thanksgiving in our heart. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we are in a no condemnation status, and that is how those of us uh, who live in the Spirit uh, uh, and, 
and that is the reality that we are uh, having before the Lord right now. There is no condemnation for us now, tomorrow, ever. Uh, and that is a reality uh, that accomplished for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and, and so we, we, we follow the chapter with that celebration in our heart, knowing that, uh, that the, the details of the chapter is the work of the Holy Spirit, applying that very truth into our life. So we, we recognize that, uh, that Paul is now unfolding uh, the work of the Spirit uh, to, to um, apply that reality of no condemnation, of justification in the process of sanctification in, in, our, in our life. And, and we, we understand that, uh, number one, he frees us from sin and death. Then he enables us to fulfill the law. He changes our nature so that we, get, we are able to respond to him and, and to, uh, to obey the law and to uh, uh, love him. And he also, now the part that we uh, will come in today, he empowers us for victory over sin. And then uh, he will confirm our adoption as children of God. Uh, he guarantees our glory. Uh, he makes sure that uh, glorification process uh, will include us. And he intercedes for us uh, each and every day. So the Holy Spirit is applying uh, to, to our lives the reality that uh, accomplished for us in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and and uh, the, the one factor uh, that we learn today is that uh, he enables us uh, uh, empower us uh, for victory over sin. Uh, and, and, and that is in verse uh, 12 and 13. So uh, Paul, Paul said, So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Uh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if the Spirit uh, you are put into death, if, but if by the Spirit you are put into death, the deeds of the body you will live. And then with that, he leads into a, a glorious reality, and, and that is uh, we are children of God, uh, uh, adopted uh, uh, for eternity uh, to be in God's family. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Uh, so we, we know that we are already in the no condemnation status, meaning God has placed us uh, under justification, that he has declared us righteous, that he is... Uh, uh, Declare a penalty paid and uh, and sin forgiven, uh, and so we never have to pay the penalty again. We never have to deal with God in terms of uh, a punishment again. Uh, that is all done uh, by by the Lord Jesus Christ. So so uh, even I just said it very quickly. You know we need to grasp hold of that concept. Even the the sense of punishment. We 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 always think that you know you do some wrong, God God going to punish us. No more punishment, no more condemnation. There, there's a time when he would discipline us, but that's not no punishment, that is correction, so that we can become better uh, for him. Uh, and it is uh, his time and his purpose. But uh, we are also free from the penalty of sin, uh, which is death and eternal death. So we, uh, we are free from that and free from the penalty, free from the, uh, the corruption of, uh, uh, of death uh, uh, in the process of our sanctification, that we will be overcoming sin. And uh, he enables us to keep God's law uh, and uh, transform us and now uh, give us uh, in the battle of the flesh uh, day to day uh, on the daily basis. Uh, the Holy Spirit uh, now give us victory, and today we learn of the key to that spiritual victory. And there are uh, two points uh, in, in, in the text, in two verses that we learn, and they are very profound and uh, very important to understand. And number one uh, is we live as debtors of the Spirit. So uh, there are keys uh, to the spirit victory, and number one, we live as debtors of the Spirit. And number two, we war to kill sins by the Spirit. So number one, we live as debtors of the Spirit. Number two, we, we war to kill sin by the Spirit. Now, uh, when we just uh, hear this, thing, it might be a bit strange or maybe it's a, a disconnect to us. But as we go into the detail, we will see the marvelous truth, uh, how it is uh, uh, a, a, a guidance, but also a, a, a connection to uh, the Holy Spirit power 
for us to overcome sin. So let's go straight to uh, uh, verse 12 for point number one, and that is we live as letters of the Spirit. Paul declare, So then, brother, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Uh, or a uh, closer translator would say, Therefore, brethren, we are letters not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. So the first principle to have victory over sin is to live in gratitude of grace. To live in gratitude of grace. And so uh, Paul put that in, in the common language uh, that we are debtors. Now this is a fundamental principle in the conduct of the believers and the motivation behind the fight uh, against sin um, in response uh, to the guidance and control by the Holy Spirit. So we, we, we need to master this principle in order to live with the power of grace. Uh, so, so here's the key that God opened up to us in connection to the power of grace, to live in response to uh, the guidance and control of the Holy Spirit in our fight against sin. And, and here's uh, how we're going to connect uh, to overcome sin and to have victory over sin. So what is in view here is the work of the Holy Spirit in enabling us uh, for victory over sin because he said that... Uh, uh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are put into death the deeds of the body, so put into death uh, sins, you will live. So we're talking about victory here. Uh, and, and so we remember that it's uh, not just that we are declared righteous, uh, that is justification, but we are also transformed. We are converted, we are regenerated, uh, we are born again uh, with a new inner man. Uh, and, and that inner man is totally changed and we are a new creation uh, uh, and, and, but we understand that the, the new creation is, is still uh, living in the, the old bodies with, 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 you know, with the decay uh, humanness and so uh, Paul called that the flesh and there's a real battle going on uh, there and we went through uh, Romans 7 talking about the battle between uh, the, the, the new creation, the new inner man, and the indwelling uh, sin in the body. Uh, and, and so uh, that uh, led us to the, the, the conflict that we are in today. Uh, and Paul is saying that uh, in that conflict, you, ha you have uh, the, the connection to the Holy Spirit uh, to have victory. Uh, but we have to understand uh, where to begin. And he said, therefore, brethren, we are debtor, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. But, you, but uh, you, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But by the Spirit, you put the, uh, to death the deeds of the body. You will live. You will win. You will overcome. Uh, so we have the provision by the Holy Spirit here. And these uh, two verses uh, is telling us uh, that the Holy Spirit uh, has come into our lives. Uh, change our nature. Uh, he has taken up residence in, uh, in us and now provide us uh, in a, a status with, with God uh, of no condemnation uh, as well as the power to overcome sin in the body, the dwelling sin that's still with us. Uh, so the focus here is on what the Holy Spirit is doing uh, in us. Uh, he, uh, he is taking what, God, uh, what Christ has done at the cross uh, and apply to us. He's taking the justification given to us and apply to us uh, in reality, making that a, uh, a uh, uh, transformation uh, of uh, 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 conversion in, in, our, in our lives. Uh, so uh, the, the point of focus today is on this, the struggle that we have uh, with sin and he applied that power, that justification, that transformation uh, and uh, help us to overcome. So the, the key to understanding uh, these uh, two verses is the, small, uh, is the short phrase in verse uh, 13, by the Spirit. And, and the phrase by the Spirit is kind of like the umbrella uh, over the two points that we have in the outline. Uh, everything that God does in our lives, He does by the Holy Spirit. So we live in a constant uh, and joyful obligation to the Holy Spirit. And this speaks to the connection that we have with the power of life in the Holy Spirit. And that result in the victory over sin in, in us. 
So by the Spirit we are put into death the deeds of the body. By the Spirit we, we kill sin basically. Uh, so talking about the means, the, 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 the ways that God pro uh, provides, the how to, the, 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 the practice of killing sin, uh, overcoming sin by the power, by the power of, the, of, of the Holy Spirit in, our, in the process of sanctification. So the first point that we need to connect here uh, is, uh, is uh, stated very succinctly but very powerfully by Paul and he said that brother, brother and we are debtor uh, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Now Paul is, uh, is doing something very special here. He intentionally left out the main point in the phrase for emphasis. Because in our mind, we automatically will fill in the blank uh, since, we, since what he implies is very obvious and very clear. Uh, and so by so doing, Paul is kind of etches uh, the main focus into our mind without actually saying it out loud. So he said that, therefore, brethren, we are debtor not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. And then our mind would automatically fill in. But we are debtor to the spirit, so we are to live according to the spirit because that's the point. The, the point is he stated the, 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 the negative and leave the positive for us to fill in, but the, the main focus is on the positive. So, so, so the statement is uh, very succinct, like I said, but each component um, packed full of meaning. Uh, and so we, 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 we say, therefore, brethren, we are debtors. So we're going to look at, into those uh, three, three words or three, three components, the word therefore, the word brethren and the word debtors. So, so today we kind of go slow, we're going to go by, by words uh, instead of just by the phrase. Now, the word therefore, uh, I hope that we uh, already developed the habit uh, of looking at uh, uh, connection words just like the, uh, the word therefore, because when, when we see the word therefore, we know that it indicates the direction of the text. We always ask the question when we see the word therefore that what it is there for, right? Well, what's the point? What's the connection? And, and Paul is pulling the whole context, the prior context at, uh, in chapter 8 uh, to establish the force behind the argument that we must behave a certain way uh, because we are debtors of the Holy Spirit. Now, in what way are we debtors of the Holy, Holy Spirit? Now, we, we will look into the concept of uh, being under obligation uh, as uh, debtor to the Holy Spirit, but uh, now we need to uh, first establish the connection by the word therefore. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the word therefore again connect us uh, to the life in the in the spirit that uh, already start in verse one that we just uh, that we stated that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, this is a this is a marvelous reality. Uh, that is uh, due to the work of Christ for us uh, on the cross, ac accomplished by the redemptive work uh, by his blood. But not only by the work of Christ, because uh, Christ did the work at the cross, but now the Holy Spirit is applied into our life. Uh, and, and so we see the application into our life because after verse 1, we see, we, we, we see the connection to the Holy Spirit right away. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free, set you free from the law of sin and of death. Uh, uh, and, and, and so the spirit frees us from sin and, and, and death on the basis of the work of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul has established the linkage now uh, so that we, we understand the greatness of our debt to the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's why he said we are debtors not to the flesh but to the spirit. Uh, in the context, because the context is now in contrast, the flesh and the spirit, so we need to, to, to get there. But we also understand that we need to review this in because, uh, again, uh, the, the death of it will uh, be uh, um, uh, a connection uh, to the uh, proportionality of uh, the indebtedness that we have with the Holy Spirit. So first he said the Holy Spirit apply what Christ has done on the cross to free us from, from sin and, and from death. We are free from the power of sin. We are free from the penalty of, uh, of sin, which is death. Uh, and, and how was that done? Uh, for what the law was powerless to do, verse 3, uh, it, uh, because it was weakened by the sinful nature, 
God did it by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be sin offering and so he condemned sin in the, in, in the flesh, in the body of Christ. So God, God did what the law could not do and, and the Holy Spirit take what uh, has been done, apply to us and free us from the requirement of the law, free us from the requirement of sin uh, and, and, and so move us forward. But then the, the, the second thing we saw about the Holy Spirit ministry is that he enabled us to fulfill God's law. Not only that we are justified by the work of Christ, but uh, in actuality we fulfill God's law. Uh, because in verse 4 he said that, so uh, he, he, he applied uh, the work of Christ uh, uh, unto us so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. So we, we know this before, and I just want to reconnect to that. It is fulfilled in us, not only fulfilled by Christ, but it is fulfilled in us. Uh, in us, who are, who are we? Uh, we are those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So we are not under condemnation uh, uh, be, uh, because uh, rather than violating God's law as we have before, we are now in the process of fulfilling God's law uh, by the righteousness of Christ, yes, but also because of the trans transformation that has happened in us. That's why he said, uh, we are those who uh, do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. So, so not only he frees us from sin, not only that uh, he is enable, enabling us to fulfill God's law, he is changing us to make it possible uh, and, and we see the, the whole process of, of change from verse 5 to verse 11. And this is where it set up, you know, the flesh and the, and the spirit in contrast, moving us into uh, uh, verse 12. So he changed our nature, and, uh, and uh, with a blanket statement in uh, the bottom of verse 4, uh, 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 and we are no longer those who walk according to the flesh, who live according to the flesh, who manifest uh, the flesh, but we are those who walk according to the Holy Spirit. We live according to the Holy Spirit. And that is uh, transformation uh, from within. And, and, and so he said that, uh, what is the reality of that transformation? What is the reality of that change? Verse 5, we are not minding the things of the flesh, but minding the things of the Holy Spirit. So we have a new mindset. We have a new, uh, new value system. We have a new uh, purpose of life, and it's not about the flesh, not about the world, not about things uh, concerning ourselves and concerning the needs of this world. But uh, we set our minds on the things of the Holy Spirit. We live according to the Holy Spirit. So he said, for those who live according to the flesh, set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, set the things, uh, their minds on the things of the Spirit. Uh, and then in verse 6, uh, he said that uh, we're no longer, uh, 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 you know, moving toward death uh, or experiencing death in, in, in our life, in our, our pursuit. But now uh, in the Spirit, uh, we experience a true life in the Lord and true peace with God. Uh, verse 6, for the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. So here are the transformation. No longer our, our, our life is uh, futile, no longer it's, it's vain, it's without values, it's empty, it's hopeless. But now we live out in, in full expectation, full experience of God's joy uh, of life, uh, the fullness of the, aband uh, of the abundance uh, of, uh, of, of, of His uh, life in us. And we live in peace with Him uh, and we, we carry the message of peace from Him. And, and uh, Paul go on and explain more the, the change in the nature in verse 7. He, he said that before uh, we have the mind uh, of the flesh and set uh, uh, our uh, minds on the, the things of the flesh. And uh, that is rebelling against God because he said that the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God for it not, not even able to do so. Uh, so, uh, at the core uh, foundation of, of, of the human heart, uh, we are rebellious people. Uh, we, we are hostile toward God. And, and, and not only that we are hostile and rebellious, uh, we are unable to, to, to live for God. We don't want to, we are unwilling, but we are also unable. 
Now that change, we are not no longer hostile toward God. We love God. We worship Him. And we want to fulfill God's law. And not only we want to and willing, we are now able to move forward in fulfilling God's law because of the transformation in us and the, the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and therefore moving us to the, the life that is for the purpose of pleasing God. Verse 8. Before we are those in the flesh cannot please God. Uh, just like those who are in the flesh cannot please God, we will not live in a life pleasing to God. But, but it's all changed. Uh, that changed the whole orientation of life. And, and, and we said last time that the summation of the, of the Christian life is to be pleasing to God. Uh, we said that we make it an ambition for our life to be pleasing to God. And, and uh, the, the, the reality of that transformation, of the change, is the fact that the Holy Spirit now dwells within us. He is dwelling within us uh, in verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Indeed, the Spirit of God dwells in you because the Holy Spirit uh, dwells in you. And so we have the transformation, not because we try hard, because we do things, uh, but because He is in us and He manifests His life in us and through us. And therefore, the reality is, uh, is, is there and is uh, evident and is verifiable. As, <laughs> uh, and uh, therefore, we are alive. Verse 10 said, If Christ in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. So, so not that we are saved, uh, and not only that we are saved and declared righteous, uh, we are given the life and we are uh, given the life to live fully even though the, the body is decaying, even though physically we may be dying and, and, and that he moves to the next, the, 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 the next point. And that is he will take care of, 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 the, of the body. There will be redemption of the body. There will be glorification. And there will be resurrection for our body from the dead. So verse 11, he said, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus uh, from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, can you feel the force? That's what Paul is saying. Therefore, so, so then, knowing all of that, uh, we, we have a deep sense of obligation. We have a deep sense of, uh, of connection to the Holy Spirit. So if, if we fail to understand all these components, we, we fail to see the, 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 the depth uh, of his work and the power that required to uh, provide us all this transformation, uh, we might just kind of, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm saved, I get to go to heaven, and that's it. And, and then we live uh, the, the life we used to live. And that's the problem. Uh, and he said, uh, that's why we, we do not overcome sin, and, and to be able to overcome sin, we have to realize that we are debtors of the Holy Spirit and under, to, to understand the death of our indebtedness, of our obligation, we have to understand what the Holy Spirit has done for us. So he said, therefore, you must look at these things, you must uh, consider these things, and you must examine these things uh, to, to see the vast work that the Holy Spirit has done for you. So we say that all of that and more to come has established a deep and abiding relationship between uh, believers and the Holy Spirit, between each one of us and the Holy Spirit. And again, I may say that, you know, we, we don't have the sense of obligation, a proper sense of obligation, the proper appreciation of the Holy Spirit, because we don't read this sin. Uh, and we, we read so fast, we, we don't see the truth behind these sins. But now he's saying that, you know, take the time, deal with that, because this is the reality of what he has done. And, and Paul said, therefore... Connect to this thing so that you have a proper response to the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, so therefore, there are obvious results that come out from such a powerful relationship with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and, and therefore, there are considerations uh, and uh, uh, connection and direction that we will live uh, as debtors of the Holy Spirit. We'll get to that point. I don't want to jump ahead. But the word, therefore, help us to see that and make that connection. Now the second word we want to note is the word brethren that Paul now insert in the way he addresses his readers then and, uh, and us today. Therefore, brethren. Now, it may just seem like you know, a simple word, but, uh, but in the context of, 
of, of the contrast between the mindset of, of the world and the mindset on the things of the flesh and, and, and the war, uh, the hostility of the people uh, with, uh, of the flesh against God, unable to please him, unwilling to please him, uh, uh, going for, the, you know, uh, for it, uh, death now and eternal death uh, uh, instead of life in God and peace in God. He said there are two groups of people in the world, those who are, belong to the flesh and the world, and those who belong to the Holy Spirit. And, you see, and he said, brother, we are this group. We belong to the Holy Spirit. We are special. We are different. So, so it is the word that identifies the people of the Spirit. It is the word, obviously, of love and fellowship. It is uh, primarily a word of identification. So Paul wants to highlight the awesome privilege of belonging to the Holy Spirit. Uh, so so to, to show that we are uh, greatly blessed, that those who be belong to the Holy Spirit, the, the, the band of brothers, so to speak, uh, are those who are tremendously blessed. Uh, so, so Paul said that I want you to really understand and appreciate the fact that we are different from the world. Uh, you, you, you identify yourself as uh, people of the Spirit. Uh, you are different from the world. We are a band of brothers united in the Spirit because we belong to Him. Uh, united how? United in our common mindset, uh, and, that, and that is our value system, our decision process, our life purpose, in that, that we live together for the things of the Spirit. He said, we are, we are those that He said before, from the word therefore, set our minds on the things of the Holy Spirit. We have the mindset of the Spirit. We pursue the things of the Holy Spirit. We, 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 we live uh, to please God. Uh, we live in response to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We live in the hope for, for glory because He, he going to return and give us the resurrection from the dead. Now, we are that kind of people. We are not the kind of people who just mind the things of the world, live for, for the, 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 you know, the, the here and now, uh, as the world, we are brothers. We are the band of brothers. So, so it's very important to say that we, we share the common bond of fellowship because we all live with the ambition and the purpose to please God. We are totally opposite to the way we were uh, and the way of the people of the world. Now, it's easy to say these things, but, uh, you know, just the word brothers, let, let, let us ourselves, are, are we identified with that group or... Uh, are we more comfortable or more uh, the same with the group that has had the mindset of the world and the things of the world? So, so Paul, in, in, in uh, just one word, kind of draw the line. As you say, what, 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 what group are you in? What side are, are, uh, do you belong to? And, and there's two groups, there's two, two, two sides. And uh, with that line, he kind of divide up the whole world. And we automatically have to know where we are. So just turn to the person next to you and say brothers or sister, depending on who that person looked like. But just to make sure that, you know, we identify with the, the group that belongs to God. And so we are now, the, instead of uh, uh, belonging to the group that hostile toward God, unwilling and unable to please God, but we are for God, we are belong to God, <coughs> we are more than willing, and we are now able uh, to please God because uh, the enablement of the Holy Spirit. We live for God's pleasure and we live for God's purpose. I mean, just, just those phrases are just loaded with, with transformation. We live for God's pleasure. Is that true? Or do we live for our pleasure? He said, well, if you, have, if you belong to this band of brothers who belong to the, to the Holy Spirit, you live for God's pleasure. You live to please God. That is your ambition. That's what drives you forward. That's, that's, that's what your life is all about. And we said, really, you know, if, if that's true, I'm, uh, you know, I need to really consider uh, the reality of my life. Uh, so Paul said, we are a band of brothers in relationship with the Spirit and in the pursuit of God's purpose. But there's uh, an exhortation here that, uh, that's uh, uh, that also a, a call to unity. Paul is calling the brother to war. Uh, war against sin. That's it, that's it in point two. We war against sin. We will be killed in sin by the Holy Spirit. So we get to that point, but he's now identifying the group that we war in against sin. We are, we are in the war for God, yes, but we are also in the fight together 
uh, to fight against sin by the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's comradery in, in arms. We don't war against sin alone. Uh, we have the Holy Spirit, but we also have the church. And that's, uh, he said, uh, brethren. So as you know, you know, soldiers in, in, in battle uh, fight primarily for one another before they even consider the military objectives. First is to protect your brothers. First is to keep everybody alive and then move together toward the objective. Same thing with the church, same thing with the spiritual life. And, 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 and so again, we are confronted with the reality is that we don't fight for our brothers uh, as much or as we should. We, we don't even know, you know, the struggle uh, of the person next to us, but, but Paul said we are in the fight together. Brother, we all belong in, 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 in this group and we must uh, understand that. So, so Paul is uh, identifying uh, uh, with them in the conflict because we already seen him uh, in uh, chapter 7. He said, I'm in conflict. I'm in the war. I'm, f I'm fighting against sin. I, uh, I, I see that conflict in me all the time, and I know you are too. And so uh, that is a fight that we must be, uh, be together. Now, the, the rest of the war, the, the war has no war. Uh, they don't fight against sin. They are part of, uh, of the world. So, so they belong to the world. They set their minds on the flesh. They do the things uh, concerning with the flesh. So they don't fight with the flesh. They just go along. So, so, so again, there's a separation. Uh, uh, Paul said, we, we fight against the, the flesh. We're not uh, uh, part of the world. We fight against sin. And, and we, we are in it together. But, uh, but there's one thing that unites God's people all together uh, is the sense of obligation. And that's what Paul is striving at. He said, brethren, we are debtors. Uh, therefore, knowing what we know, knowing that we belong to the Holy Spirit, we have to realize something very deep and very profound. We are debtors to him. So he declared in verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Now, like, like I said, Paul left out the, the, the obvious, unsaid for emphasis. Uh, and so it's ringing in our mind. He said, uh, therefore, brethren, we are debtor to the, to the Holy Spirit. And that's just what imply. Uh, and that's implied from, all the word, uh, from the word therefore that we just established. So it is because the Holy Spirit frees us from the law of sin and death, because the Holy Spirit enables us to keep the God's law, and because he transforms our nature that we are no longer under condemnation. And so we bless him and we realize that we are under great obligation to him. Uh, so let me just uh, state both the negative and the positive together uh, like this. Therefore, brethren, we are debtor to the Holy Spirit. So to live according to the Holy Spirit, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Uh, so first being debtor, let's look into the, that sense of obligation from the word debtor. Uh, being a debtor is being under an obligation. Now, it's easy to understand. Uh, have you borrowed money from, a, from anybody? Now, once you borrow money from somebody, somebody you, you immediately put yourself under obligation to that, uh, that one person or that person uh, that you borrow from. Sometimes, you know, we borrow from them and we pass due and so we see them. We don't want to talk to them, so we duck. Uh, we, we, you know, it affects our behavior. Uh, it's a, uh, we have the obligation as debtor. Proverbs 22, 7 said that the borrowers become slaves to the lenders. And so that the sense of obligation is very strong. Uh, it's not necessarily about money. You know, it, uh, it's easy to understand money, but uh, have you ever received unexpected or undeserved kindness from, from, from people, from, from others, even from stranger? And when, when you're on the receiving end, there's, there's an obligation, even though obligation uh, to grace. Uh, you don't pay back obligation to grace. But there's a sense uh, of debt in terms of gratitude, in terms of appreciation. And Paul is talking about that. Paul is not talking about obligation that we have to pay back, but the sense of obligation of gratitude, the sense of obliga uh, obligation of appreciation. And, and in, in human relationship uh, alone, we understand uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the heartlessness 
the ingratitude, the thanklessness, is just the worst things uh, in relationship. Few things are, uh, are worse than uh, a heartless, thankless, ungrateful person. And so Paul is talking about that kind of obligation, that kind of uh, debt, uh, indebtedness to the Holy Spirit. Now, Scripture say we are debtors to God. So, so the, the term is very common in, in Scripture. When we sin against God, we are debtors to the demands of God's law, meaning we have to pay the wages of sin, which is death, and, and therefore we are debtor uh, to, uh, to God. We are under God's wrath. Why? Because we have to pay the penalty of sin. That's why Scripture said we are debtors uh, to God's wrath. Um, but when we are forgiven, we are debtors to His grace. So when we, when we are forgiven, and he said, uh, forgiven, no charge, all, 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 zero, the, uh, all account zero, he already paid for it by, by his blood. And so we now become debtors, not of wrath anymore, but now we are debtors of his grace. And, uh, and the more we understand of grace, the more sense of indebtedness we are in. And, and that's why uh, the re request for forgiveness in, uh, in the Lord's Prayer makes it very clear. It said that uh, in, in Matthew 6, 12, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. It used the word not sin, but debts. Uh, not forgive our sin, but use the word of debts so that it's, it's emphasized. Now, uh, we, we, we want to develop this sense of indebtedness, this sense of, of, of obligation, because I think uh, it's, uh, it's well underdeveloped in many of us, or in all of us, uh, insufficient understanding of grace and therefore insufficient development of, of obligation for the Holy Spirit. So we want to take uh, scripture that point out this sense of obligation to us. Uh, so turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter uh, 18. Matthew chapter 18 uh, tells a story um, <coughs> uh, uh, about a servant uh, that uh, that owed the uh, the the master ten thousand talents, uh, and so uh, here the the holy uh, the, the the scripture telling us that you know our debt uh, against God is very very great. Now when 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 we're talking about ten thousand talent of gold, it's it's like you know you owe somebody two billion dollars uh, in in our time or twenty billion dollars. So it's an inconceivable number, uh, you know, the amount of, of debt. So that kind of points to the greatness of our debt uh, beyond imagination toward God. And we are expected to live properly in the sense of indebtedness to God in our behavior toward our own debtors. Uh, so be, being a debtor to God, uh, the sense of obligation to God, dictate how we live. Let's, uh, let's start in, uh, in verse 23. <clears throat> said that uh, for this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle the accounts with his slave when he had begun to settle them one of them owed him 10,000 talents and was brought to him but since he did not have the means to repay his lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made so the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. So, so, so talking about, you know, forgiving the huge debt of two, $20 billion, just like that, you know, you're free to go. But, but the story, uh, as you recall, uh, we won't have time to read the whole thing, but the, the story is that the slave went out without the proper understanding of his indebtedness to the master without obligation of, of, of the debt to grace uh, that he just incurred by that forgiveness. So he acted toward his fellow man independently of his obligation to God and showed the true condition of his heart. He actually went out and, and demand payment of 100 denarii, meaning about 50 bucks. Uh, and, 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 and then the... the, the, the the other debtor to him cannot pay, he threw, he threw him in, in jail. And so clearly uh, Jesus is saying that the understanding of your obligation to God, of His grace, must dictate your value system, your decision process in life. Now God does not require us to pay Him back because it's grace, 
but he requires transformation, understanding and the sense of obligation from our forgiveness. And the evidence must be clear in our response and in our behavior. So God is saying that he, you know, in, in, in the story he said uh, uh, with, uh, with the, uh, <clears throat> with the unforgiven uh, uh, servant, he said uh, that uh, someone in him was uh, 32. His Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you ple pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should pay all that he was owed him. So, so God is saying it is no, matter, no small matter to him, this, uh, this understanding of indebtedness, this understanding of obligation. And, and the heartlessness, the ingratitude, the thanklessness betray that sense of grace. <clears throat> so, so there is a correct response uh, because of the sense of indebtedness and gratitude of being indebted to, to God is so essential uh, to, to the understanding of what Paul is saying. We, uh, I want to expand that a little bit more. So let's look with me in Luke uh, chapter 7. Another story and about Jesus again to, to, to compare the response of, of, of uh, a person who understands his debt uh, of forgiveness. So in, uh, in Luke 7 uh, from verse uh, 41 on, as you, re as you remember, uh, Jesus uh, was uh, uh, in, a, in a home of the Pharisee named Simon. And, and so, verse 40, uh, parables of two dead. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon replied, say it, teacher. A money lender has two debtors, one owed 50, uh, 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them would love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who... Uh, he forgave more, and he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I enter your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she had wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, had not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loved little. And so, so here, again, the point is made. Your sense of obligation, your understanding of indebtedness to God, to Christ, and to the Holy Spirit, determines your response to grace, proportionally. So if you think you are only owe 50 denarii, then your life will show a response to that degree, which is pretty little. If you, uh, you, you, if you understand that you owe much, in this case, 500 denarii, just for comparison, then you will live that much more in response. I tell you, uh, Jesus said to Simon, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who has been forg uh, forgiven little loves little. We, we, we need to understand this factor. We, we need to understand this because this is the point that, that Paul is saying that the, 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 the sense, uh, the, the key to victory over sin is not something that you try, but that, uh, something deep in your heart in response to grace. And, and you must realize how, how much grace is to you before you can tap into that power. So keep that in mind. Now I want to, to continue with uh, uh, two more examples here because it strengthened uh, the succinct statement that uh, Paul made. He said that, therefore, brethren, we are debtor, uh, and, 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 and this principle is not just a theory for Paul. Uh, it is real life experience uh, to, to him. Uh, so when Paul declared, uh, you know, brother, we are debtor, he, he expects more than just our agreement to truth uh, or just say that, okay, we understand the principle. He wants to make sure that we apply this in terms of our obligation respond to the gracious work of the Holy Spirit. He wants us to, to, to make decisions concerning uh, our understanding of, of, of grace. And, 
And there's a good example in, uh, in his own life uh, in, the, in the book of Philemon. So if you turn to the book of Philemon, uh, you, will, you, you will see that, uh, that, that, that example. <coughs> so Philemon is, uh, is uh, b b before the book of Hebrew uh, and uh, uh, verse 17 to 21. But... Uh, just uh, a, a, a quick summary of the, the situation. Philemon is an old friend of Paul. Now Paul led him uh, to Christ and uh, Paul discipled him uh, to be a mature and fruitful servant of the Lord. Now Philemon has a slave named Onesimus uh, who uh, runs away uh, all the way to Rome. And Paul met him, uh, Onesimus, uh, in Rome and sent him back to Philemon with a letter requesting Philemon to forgive the slave and take him back. But not only take him back as slave, but take him back as a son because of the relationship that Philemon has with Paul. Now this short letter to Philemon illustrates uh, the picture of God's grace to us as guilty runaway slave uh, uh, whom God brings back and forgives, but not only as a slave, but uh, uh, as sons all because uh, of, uh, of the grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what is very interesting is uh, in this letter, Paul invoked this sense of indebtedness. He, he invoked the sense of, uh, of letters to grace uh, and uh, required for Philemon to, to respond to grace in, in this way, to make a decision concerning uh, for, uh, his slave uh, and... Uh, we see that in verse uh, 17 to 21. Let me just read that for you. So Paul is uh, asking, and he said, If then you regard me as a partner, accept him, meaning Onesimus, as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, I am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe me uh, you, you owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. So Paul is really a really clever man here. He said, I won't even mention the fact that you owe me big. Uh, you owe me your life because, uh, Christ let, uh, because Paul led him to Christ and uh, and and uh, disciple him. So while saying that, I won't mention it. He actually mentioned it and and bring attention to the the fact that Philemon, you owe me, and and out of that sense of obligation, I expect you to behave in a certain way toward uh, uh, toward your slave Onesimus, and uh, fulfill my request. So the point here is that the sense of obligation to grace compel Philemon then and us now to make proper decision in manifesting grace in our life. Now, in, in, in Paul, Paul, uh, Paul's case himself, he lived under a tremendous sense of obligation to God. And, and uh, uh, this one more example, and then we come back to, to, the, to the, the Roman text. So, uh, in, in Roman 12, uh, Paul said very simply that we are debtors, uh, and Paul understand the being uh, under the, uh, that sense of obligation transformed his, his whole life. He, uh, he write to uh, his uh, son in the faith, uh, Timothy, in the first book of Timothy, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 12 to 14. He explained his whole, his whole life of service is due to the fact that he, he was under obligation to God. So verse 12, he said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in, uh, in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was more than abundant with the faith and love which I found in Christ Jesus. And then he said, it is a trustworthy statement deserving for accepting that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, am among whom I am the foremost of all. Yes, for this reason, I found mercy. So he keeps saying that I found mercy. I understand mercy. I, I, I know that my obligation uh, because uh, Jesus uh, has uh, called me into service. 
in uh, first uh, chapter uh, 15 of first Corinthians he said this again he said that I am the least of the apostle and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God but by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect no I work harder than all of them yet not I but the grace of God uh, that was with me therefore then it was I uh, this is uh, what we preach this is what you believe. So Paul, Paul said that I understand the, uh, the obligation to grace. I understand my indebtedness to God. When I say, brethren, we are debtors, I know that I am the greatest debtor of all. Uh, and grace given me not in vain. He said, I understand grace. And so w grace has given me not in vain, meaning without effect, without, uh, w without proper response. He said, I became the servant of the gospel and I work uh, and labor uh, with my utmost for Christ. And, and, and so Paul said, this is the driving force in my life. And, and, and so he said, the driving force in your life must be that sense of indebtedness to, to the Holy Spirit. So with that, let's uh, think through the, uh, the uh, implication of the principle of, of, of living as a debtor to the Holy Spirit. So, back to uh, verse 12 of Romans 8. Therefore, brethren, you, we are debtor not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. And then by uh, implied, uh, but debtors to the spirit, so we are to live according to the spirit. So this is the foundation of victory over sin. Because he's talking about, you know, uh, we will have victory uh, over sin. We will, we will live, we will put sin to death. But how so? How can a life in response to grace connect to the Holy Spirit is the key to victory over sin. Now this is where we get down to, uh, you know, where the rubber, the rubber meets the, the road. Uh, and this is a key for, for victory over sin. And it is very simple and very powerful. Victory over sin depends on whom you respond to, or to whom you feel obligated to, or to whom you, you owe the debt. So, so let me say that again. Victory over sin depends on whom you respond to or to whom you feel obligated to or to whom you owe the debt. So, so Paul, Paul is saying that it starts not with your own effort but the sense of understanding of grace. So Paul said uh, you owe nothing to the flesh. You have no obligation to the flesh. He said, brethren, we are debtor not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. But your obligation is clear, and by, like I said, by, uh, by his uh, not even stating that, it's uh, obvious that we are adapted to the Spirit, so we are to live according to the Spirit. So the pattern of, of, of the victory over sin is simple. Number one, don't live according to the flesh, because you don't have to. Uh, you have no obligation to the flesh. You have no need to respond to the flesh. You, have, uh, you, have, you don't have anything to do with the flesh. And so don't respond to the flesh. And so he already explained that and we went through that in verse 5. He said you no longer after the flesh. You, you no longer do things uh, uh, with the mindset of the flesh and follow the, you know, the things of the flesh. Uh, you, you, you no longer hostile toward God uh, uh, or unable to please God. Uh, you are now for God and you are able and willing to, to, to please God. So you, you, you're different. You're no longer with the flesh. You have nothing to do with the flesh. So, so don't follow as if you are obligated to do. Meaning, meaning uh, now if you sin, it is, it is your choice to sin. It's not because you have to sin. Like before, when you're in the flesh, there's nothing you can do but sin because everything you do out of the flesh is sin. So you are under obligation of the flesh and therefore you will follow the flesh. And therefore, whatever you do, you sin. But now you are free of the flesh. You're no longer under obligation of the flesh. So when you sin, actually you choose to sin. Uh, you make the choice to sin. And he said, don't make that choice. It's a ridiculous choice. It's, it's, it's a contradictory choice. It's so just think about that. How ridiculous now that you will still choose to follow sin, uh, to follow the, the, the flesh to sin. How contradictory to who you are. How unthinkable, brother. So he said, you know, we, we belong to the group that, that respond to the Holy Spirit, belong to the Holy Spirit, uh, responding to the, the, the flesh. is so inconsistent with your justification, so inconsistent with your sanctification. 
you have been free from sin uh, and the flesh, you have been delivered uh, 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 out from condemnation, you are given the ability now to fulfill the law, uh, how foolish uh, it is now that you would choose out of your free will to commit sin. Uh, so he said, you have no obligation uh, to, 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 to sin. But on, on the other side, you have all the obligation to the Holy Spirit to not to sin, um, uh, to follow the Holy Spirit. So, so he said, it's, it's, not the, it's not the choice that you sin, this particular sin or not. It is the choice who, you, who you're going to follow, who you're going to respond to. He said that uh, you've been responding to, 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 to the flesh, but now you're no longer uh, under any obligation to the flesh, but you are in huge, unspeakable, undescribable um, obligation to the Holy Spirit. You must respond to the Holy Spirit. And, and the more you understand your obligation to the Holy Spirit, you respond to Him, and it will become automatic that you won't respond to the flesh, and it will become automatic that you will overcome sin. So, so that's a very huge uh, principle that we need to understand. Uh, knowing what you know about grace, knowing about the privilege of no condemnation, knowing about the work of the Holy Spirit applying justification and sanctification into your life, knowing that you are now free, knowing that, that you are now changed, knowing that, uh, that you are now transformed, it is totally inconsistent choice, he said, to go back and listen to the flesh and act it as if you are an obligation to him. And it is inconceivable that you would deny your obligation to the Holy Spirit Ignore his voice, ignore his guidance, disconnect from his power, uh, uh, just uh, fall into his presence in, in, in your own heart, and, and choose to sin. So, so he said, when, when, when that system is established in your life, you begin to understand how to overcome sin. Now, Paul explained this uh, before to us in a very graphic uh, example, and I want to go, go back to that and just turn back to Romans chapter 7. Because he used the word, uh, the, the sense of obligation in terms of marriage. And when we first, uh, last time when we read this passage, we were kind of strange, but now you understand what he's talking about. He's talking about obligation in terms of relationship. So verse 7, uh, let me just read from 1 to 6. So he said, do you not know, brethren, I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, he is, she is released from the law concerning her husband. So then, if while her husband is living, she is joined with another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, and that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law, to the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that he might bear fruit for God. For while we are in the flesh, sinful passion, which were aroused by the law, were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law have been died to that which we were bound, so that we serve the newness of spirit and not the oldness of the latter. So in short, using the marriage uh, language, uh, Paul said in your previous relationship with your previous husband, the law and sin is dead. It's over. You have been remarried to Christ. So, so that's a clear picture. He said, you know, you have a relationship before, uh, and you have an obligation to, to sin and law, but now you die to that. So, so that relationship is over. No more obligation, no more relationship, nothing to do with that. It's over, it's done with. Now you are, you are married to Christ. That's what, what I said. My brother, you also were made to die to the law, to the body uh, of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead. You, you, you died to the previous uh, uh, relationship so that you can be joined to him. You are now married to Christ. So where, where's your sense of obligation? Where's your sense of relationship? He said, uh, your obligation now is to your, to your new husband, to, your, to Christ, to, to the Holy Spirit that is indwelling in you. It is ridiculous. It is wrong. It is so unthinkable that you would now go back to the relationship previously that was already dead, that's already gone, and acted as if you still belong to that relationship. That's, that's the whole argument here. 
He said, uh, don't you realize that you have obligation in a new relationship? It is the relation, uh, obligation to, 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 to grace. It is an obligation, indebtedness to grace, that transform you, that give you the key of victory. So I, I don't know if you uh, be able to grasp it or not, but when we talk about victory over sin, we, we're thinking about individual sin, and we think about effort that we make so that we can overcome sin. Somehow we can master sin. Somehow we can control it, control it and, and not to do it wrong. That's not how you do it. And, and, and we'll never be able to succeed uh, to, to do it that way. Paul saying that the key is understanding grace. You have to understand grace. The key to spiritual victory over sin begins with under, understanding grace. The more you understand grace, the greater is your sense of indebtedness to God. The more you understand what it took Christ to declare no more condemnation for you, the deeper sense of obligation to Him. The more you understand the gracious work of the Holy Spirit in applying what has been done at the cross for you, uh, personally setting you free from sin and death, in changing your nature with the mindset of the Holy Spirit, in enabling you to overcome sin, the, the deeper, the greater indebtedness to Him uh, will be coming you to your heart. And because now you realize and you understand the obligation that you are as debtor to Him of 10,000 uh, 10, talents instead of just five, uh, 50 denarii, you know, remember the story that we read? It's huge obligation instead of just a little bit. You, you, you know, you were behaving as if you only uh, owe him 50 uh, denarii, but in fact you owe him 10,000 talents. Once you realize that, and you realize that sense of obligation, guess what? You respond to him. You respond to the claim of grace into your life. And you, you move toward grace, and you want to be please, uh, pleasing to the God who gives you grace, and to the Holy Spirit who en enables you to experience grace, then you understand the key of victory. So understanding and responding to grace is the key to victory over sin. Not self-help effort, not trying harder, not keeping a long list, a longer list of things to do and not to do. The deeper your understanding of grace is, the greater your sense of indebtedness to God is, the more you respond to the Holy Spirit, and the more you overcome sin. Turn to the person to next to you and say, get it? And, and we must get this, because if we don't get this, we will not have victory over sin. Because that's what Paul said. You have to understand this, and then the next point is, then you'll be able to kill sin by the Holy Spirit. And I think we, we've been trying to deal with sin as, 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 you know, an individual match. Well, it's just a direction of life. You respond to the Holy Spirit because of grace, because you understand the indebtedness uh, that you have grace. So, so because of that, then the, what, what the Puritan said, the means of grace, is hugely important in, uh, in life. Now, you understand that the means of grace, right? The mean, means of grace is just that. That is the, the means to appropriate and respond to God's grace in life. And, and they are listed like, you know, the, the means of grace is worship, uh, scripture, prayer, uh, the offering, service, witness, and, and many more. But, you know, the, the main ones are the means of grace. And they are, they are the, 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 the means, uh, the vehicle to respond to grace. And so worship is absolutely important because it is a primary means to respond to grace. So if you neglect worship, you skip the assembly uh, of the sin, uh, as some of you have the habit to do, you know, uh, using the word of, of Hebrew uh, 10, 25. When you neglect worship, your sense of obligation to grace will get dull very fast. Your response capacity will decrease overnight, and you will drift away from grace and from God, and you will become easy prey to sin. And so don't be surprised that you get into sin when you neglect worship. Now, means of grace is uh, also the, the way to respond to the Holy Spirit. So reading scripture, learning scripture, studying scripture is absolutely important. Because how, how else do you understand grace? How else do you increase your appreciation to grace? If you don't learn about God and His grace and what He's done for you at the cross... Um, how, how do you get a proper sense of indebtedness if you don't have any connection to scripture? 
And also the Holy Spirit uses uh, the Word to speak to us and guide us and help us. If we're not into the Word, how do you recognize His voice? I mean, there's voices in your head and people say, I hear this and I follow this. God tell me this. No, it's not. He guides you through the Word. And if you get confused with the Word, you won't hear Him. And, 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 and then, you know, normally, if that's the case, then we know that, you know, we don't read the Word at home. And then we skip uh, the church where the Word is proclaimed. We, we ditch the class where the, where the, the Word is, is taught. Then how in the world we, we can overcome sin? So, so the means of grace is hugely important. And I can go on with that. You know, prayer, prayer uh, is a means to commune, uh, com commune with God. You pray and you pray often. You connect to God, to, uh, to, uh, to the Holy Spirit in His presence. You hear His voice. You have a habit of relationship with Him. If, we, if you don't pray or if we don't pray, then we don't have connection with Him. and We don't have any sense of obligation to Him either. How about offering or tithing? You know, this is the means to set priority in life. To, to put God first, uh, uh, every seven days, God said, make adjustment on your, uh, your priority. You've been kind of uh, deviate from, from, from me being the top. So every, every seven day, every time of worship, take your offering, recalibrate your priority of life, saying that God is first. God is uh, uh, first in my life, first priority. Say that, do that, every, uh, 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 you know, uh, every time you, go, you, you, you come to worship. If you don't do that, then how, 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 you, how are you going to readjust your priority? How, so, so that's a means of grace. Neglecting that will, you know, so then don't wonder why things are upside down in, in life. How about service? It's a means of grace. Now, the service uh, is, uh, is the, the pattern of response to grace. So are you, are you going to be a consumer or are you going to be a servant? A servant means I understand my, my obligation, I serve. Consumer means I have no idea that uh, I owe anybody anything. Actually, I think people owe me, I think God owe me, so I come in and I consume. I mean, that's a totally t uh, different response. And, and, and if you respond to grace, you must be a servant. And the sad thing is that if you choose to be a consumer, very soon you have nothing to consume because the appetite for spiritual things won't be there. And you just go in to seek yourself. And, and talking about witness, is, is the means to maintain and develop kingdom purpose in life. If, if other means of grace are not present and operation in life, then you, know, you have nothing to say. You have nothing uh, to witness become, because it will become an exercise of hypocrisy. Only, we only witness out of the sense of indebtedness to grace. Because we, we like Paul said, you know, I, I am debtor to both the Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. Why, why, why does he feel that he obligated to the people? Because he is obligated to grace. He understands his indebtedness to grace. So that is a, the, the, the key of, of victory. <laughs> uh, so debtor to grace, uh, debtor to Holy Spirit. So we must understand this, uh, this key. And, and we must remember that it is 10,000 talent, not 50 denarii, meaning our indebtedness to God, to grace, is huge, is indescribable. And when we understand that, then we say, it is ridiculous for me to respond to the flesh. I have no obligation with the flesh. I have huge obligation to the Holy Spirit. I will respond to the Holy Spirit. So I have the obligation to my new master. And I tend to the means of grace so that I can stay in tune with him. And then by doing so, I discover and experience victory over sin. <clears throat> and I experience out of time. <laughs> It's only one point. So, but I hope you understand. I, I really feel desperate that you must understand because I think it's a huge misunderstanding, huge missing point in the church that people labor to fight against sin. They, they plead they, uh, almost to death in the fight of sin and get no victory. They mean in us. They mean in me. You know, I'm, I'm part of the fight and the wrong fight too. Uh, the scripture said you don't fight that way. You just respond to grace, and, and, and therefore you must understand grace. The, the, therefore, you, 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 if you have a problem right now, maybe you have a problem with uh, you know, greed, or, uh, 
lust or something, and you say, I must fight those things. No. Tend to the means of grace. Go to worship. Go to the word. Go to prayer. Uh, engage in service. Uh, engage in tithing. Uh, put God first. Uh, automatically, when you respond to grace and let uh, yourself more in tune with the Holy Spirit, you will find strength and and power to overcome sin. And victory will become uh, more and more evident. If I, don't, I don't want to use the word automatic, but it will come as a result of our response to grace, our understanding of this truth, our application of this truth, and not because we try harder, not because we fight more, because there's no fight in us, no power in us. It is in the connection to the Holy Spirit and we don't connect to the Holy Spirit if we don't have the sense of indebtedness to, to Him. So Paul said, Brother, we are in the team. We, we are the people who understand this one truth. We are debtors to the Spirit. Do you feel that joy of debtedness, indebtedness to God? It's not a burden. It is a joy, but it's a joy that drives you, that consumes you that dictates you, that, that, uh, that limits you to sin, but frees you to live a life that is pleasing to Him. Must embrace that indebtedness, must embrace that obligation, but put yourself under the full weight of grace because it's a, it's a, a weight that frees you, that set you free, that empower you, that give you victory. So... Pray and respond to that. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to point two ne next time. Uh, uh, I mean, it's connected, it's, but I won't have time for that. So let's just just pray that that very that the very simple statement, brother, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to fulfill the desire of the flesh, to live according to the flesh. We are debtor to the Holy Spirit, so to live according to Him. Use that word for encouragement of one another and thankfulness to the Lord. So turn to the person next to you, one or two, three people, pray, and just make a commitment to respond to him and embrace the principle of victory over sin.